that kitty get situated before they come. Uh, 489. That's sure Bernadette's waiting to get her situated. <laughs> Four eighty nine. Glory amen. to His name. Somebody say Amen to that. Amen. amen. Lord, give glory. Give glory to God. Amen. Lord, give glory to God. He's worthy of your glory. Yes, He is. He's worthy of your worship. He's worthy of your praise. Amen. Psalm forty two eight. How many verses? Uh, we'll sing four. Four. Because it's a short one, and then we'll pray. Okay. Glory to His name. Church, I even read it today in the proverb that safety the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. So we pray that you keep us safe, Lord. Protect us. Bless Justin and Nicole as they go upstate Friday. Amen. For the job interview and for the apartment. And basically, all he's got to do is show proof of employment. He's got it. And he has some money saved up to pay the first couple of months, so it's great. It's a win win. Amen. And Billy's encouraging him and working with him. And we don't, we will not, we will be sad to see Justin and Nicole and the babies leave, but we'll be happy to see them settled in a place where they can grow and actually pay their rent and live. Yeah. Amen. I mean, you gotta, you gotta uh, sell your soul to live down here at times. So bless them, keep them safe and open the door up there and let them get up there safely. Bless Justin on the interview, let it go even better than he expects and let the boss find favor upon him and pay him even more money than we've wanted. So please work it all out. And watch over Kitty, watch over her protector, help her, have mercy upon her, Lord. Help her, Lord. We lift her up to you. Pray that you just touch her body and help her mind. And bless her, Lord. Cover us here tonight with your precious blood. Keep us safe from any impending storms. And thank you for those who have made it here in attendance tonight. I pray you give them ears to hear what the Spirit says to the church, giving them power to preach, clarity of thought and mind, and utterance and unction. The Holy Ghost. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Amen.
stopped in to see you today, Megan. Did they tell you? No, well, I, oh, well, that's why. I told the lady, say hello to Megan when she comes in. Aww. So, I did, I did wonder, where am I going to go this morning? <laughs> I'm, I went old school today, man. I went real old school. I went, I went old school, man. 7-Eleven coffee, buttered roll. And I took the, I, I, no, I'm telling you, God, God no, no, listen to me, I, I came back, I scraped all the butter out, it was way too much. I scraped it out, and then I threw nuts in it, to make it look a little better. <laughs> hey, listen, I went old school, can I tell you? First Peter chapter 2, verse, I, I've done that, and I, I can't, I can't tell you the last time I've, did that, I've done that. It's old school, man. No, that was old school, man. But I felt good today. Big Jim, there you are. I saw Sharon. You must have been in the bathroom. You're right. Two, chapter two. First Peter, chapter. You okay, Big Jim? Good. First Peter two seventeen. Are we good back there, fellas? Okay, good. The name of the message tonight. It's called a Christian compass. Christian compass. So if you have a compass, it tells you the, the uh, ordinances, the north, south, east, west, and then, of course, the varying degrees. But those are your primary ordinances. Well, the Christian compass, likewise, I'm going to give you four points. Not that each one's going to associate with north, west, east, south. You could figure that out yourself. I don't know how that's going to work. But north would be uh, the third one, I'll tell you that, where it says fear God. That's north. So I'll give you that much. But let's look at the first one in 1 Peter 2, 1 Peter 2, 17. This is a verse. This is a textual message. A lot of my messages, as you know, if you're here for a long time, are, are expository. I'll read a passage, I'll explain it, and I'll preach it. Pro- probably those are my uh, most sought-after messages. But, you know, as, as I read and pray, God shows me different things. So, but that's typically what I, how I normally preach. I'll, I'll sometimes preach a textual message, take a text. As they say in North Carolina, take a text, take a fit. But I'm not going to take a fit tonight. I'm going to take a text. But then you get uh, topical messages, too, where you just get a topic, a thought, uh, like a word study, and run it that way. So there's many different ways to come up with messages. This one was a text. It was a verse. And with it, I'm going to explain it, break it down. It's a natural preaching outline. It's a verse that has four little points within it. So we'll read 1 Peter 2.17, and then we'll pray again. 1 Peter 2.17. Does everybody have that? Amen. <clears throat> Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Pretty simple, isn't it? It's a Christian compass right here, church. Four little things for us to do as Christians keep us grounded in the word of God and in faith. Again, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So, first thing I'd like to say about <coughs> honor all men is our first point. That is, I'm going to give you not in a, I'm not going to do an alliteration today, but I'm just going to give you another word to s- sum it up. Make a summation. Honor all men. Everybody listening? Civility. That's the word. Civility. Honor all men. Some Christians need to hear this. Sometimes Christians, we, we, we learn the Bible. We, we know what's right. And we want to, you know, tell people about the Lord, and which is good. And maybe sometimes ram it down their throat, which isn't good. Or... Uh, Belittle them, which isn't good. We, we, you got to remember that you're still human and you're dealing with human beings. And we need to have a degree of civility when dealing with other people. I'm not just talking about Christians. We'll get to the Christians in a minute when it says love the brotherhood. But honor all men. I'll give you a couple of verses to help you with this. But think about this for a second. Honor all men. We're talking about the lost world. Your boss, your co-workers, your neighbors. People that don't know who you are in church. People that don't really know much about you other than they might see you and say hi. And just be polite. 
Be considerate. Don't be rude. Hold the door for somebody that's coming out. You see, I was at Dunkin' Donuts the other morning. This lady came out. I mean, I, I, it was an accident waiting to happen. She had one of her trays, must have been three or four cups of coffee, a bag of stuff, you know, and she's coming out like this, the key's ready to car, and I said, no, this is not going to be good. So I went out of my way, I ran, hold on, open it, oh, thank you so much, just so simple, thank you so much, genuine. I said, do you need help in your car? Oh, no, 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 I'm good, I'll get it. I said, okay, yeah. just went back. I, I don't go out of my way, but if I'm there, I see somebody, help them. Just a simple, just be civil towards people. When someone helps you, say, thank you. Please, may I have, yes. Yes, sir, thank you. Be polite. Sometimes that goes a long way. If, you're, if you are that way, and they don't know anything about your faith, and then they find that you're a Christian, you know what they're going to say? You know what they're going to say? Oh, no wonder they're so nice. Exactly. That's what they're going to say. Listen to me. When they, you, you, they don't have to, you have to witness to everybody and preach to them. But then if you're just a being kind, you're honoring all men, and then they find out that you that later on you go to church and you read your Bible, they go, they're going to go like this. Oh, no wonder they were so nice to me. Come on. Here's the opposite. You're rude and considerate. Poor example of a Christian then they see you on Sunday, get dressed up with your Bible, and go off to the car, and they assume you go into church, and they go, what's wrong with that picture? You see what I mean? So, err on the side of caution, and be civil toward people. Be polite. Can't go wrong. Sometimes Christians get the idea that they have to be kind of like, uh, sometimes, not all, be oh, you know, curt, and strong will to people because you're a Christian and you know the truth. Listen, you, they, don't, they don't know the truth. And the fact is that, you know, you do have the truth and you should be responsible for how you act. It's very important how you act. It will reflect on what people think about you. Whether they ever get saved or not is not the point. I'd rather, listen, you'd rather have a good testimony among your neighbors and workmates and students and people that you know and even if they never get saved, they, they, all they say is, well, that, that, that so-and-so was a, like, they were a good worker, they were, they were a kind person, and, you know, like that. Like the other day, I got a phone call from 7-Eleven, they were really telling me, boy, this is Megan, I don't know where you found this girl, but we gotta, we got to straighten her out. <laughs> Not at all. I mean, something like that, they, they don't have, I mean, she's going it, it, to, she, it's going to follow her, and they're going to see she's just a nice person, and kind and so forth and that, that helps a lot so just be c civil towards all men be again uh, kind and polite that's number one civility honor all men look at the next verse the next portion of that scripture it says love the brotherhood here we go love the brotherhood all right and with that i'd like you to keep your finger here in first peter we're going to come back to it in a minute let's go to john 13 gospel of john 13 Gospel of John, chapter 13. Let's look at verses 34 and 35. Very familiar verses to the church. We've read them. You've seen them. Maybe can quote them. Certainly have heard them expounded and spoken about here. Can never be exhausted. All right, John 13, 34. A new commandment I give you unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one toward another. 34, one more time. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if ye have love one toward another. That's, that's what Peter says, love the brotherhood. That's what he's talking about. By the way, isn't it interesting? I find it very interesting and not without coincidence. That in John 13, where that the 11th commandment shows up, this John 11, 34. When you read John 13, some of you know this offhand, some of you don't. The context is going to be foot washing. 
John 13 is the foot washing chapter. It's after that where he says the new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. And by this shall all men know you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. But in that context, in verses 14 and 15, you can take a look at it right there. Go look at it. Verse 14 and 15 in John, thir- in John 13. He's talking about the foot washing. And when you think about the context that he's quoting these verses, or the Lord is expounding and preaching about love, it's in the context of the foot washing. What is the foot washing? If you read verse 14 and 15 to yourself, that's the context. That's what he's talking about. If I then your Lord and Master have washed your feet, so ye ought also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do this, do as I have done it to you. Well, wait a minute. He said, if you have love one to another, you'll know that you're my disciples. Then he says before that in a few verses that follow the example I gave you of washing feet. Well, here's, the th- here's what I get out of it. Honor all men is civility. Love the brotherhood is service. It's service. It's you serving others to whatever ability, capacity you have. How will they know that you are a Christian? How will your brothers and sisters even know anything about you when you do a service, when you're helping somebody, you're serving, you're doing something? That's why the foot washing is important. Not that you have to do foot washing specifically. I mean, I don't know of... uh, there are some churches that have done foot washing ceremonies and services. I, I've never been involved in one specifically. And it doesn't have to be literally taken that way. But if you take the essence of the foot washing, and that's what I think is important. I mean, let's face it, we wear clothes, shoes, except in the summer now, right? So, you know, talking about 2,000 years ago in Israel, they had sandals. And dusty feet, and it was a cultural thing where you wash feet. Even today in the Middle East, it's, it's a practice you wash your feet so that was more of a cultural thing but it, but in addition to that being culturally true which it is it also reflects something if you have to it, it embody something i should say if you are to wash somebody's feet you have to kneel down bend down get low look get low got it look <laughs> rub your little feet <laughs> i didn't do it last night for you i'm sorry <laughs> She said, I was tired. Can you rub my feet? I said, okay, I can't run. I can't move right now. I'm sorry. But to, 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 listen, you got to get down low. You humble yourself. And you're doing something to serve someone else. Here the Lord girded himself with a towel. The Lord. And he washed the disciples' feet. The Lord did that. And then he said, if you're my disciples, you, this is my example. He's given us an example that we need to remember and think about when we deal with each other. You know, listen. You have, some, of us, some of us have big families. Some of us has, have small families. Everybody's family dynamic is somewhat different. But family is family. You don't always uh, like family. Not always, but you, know, but you have to love them. Right? I mean, sometimes you love your family member and like them. And that's a good thing. But you still have to love them even if you don't really like them. They might not be your best friend if they weren't family. He's, Can I get an amen? amen? Well, you know what happens in church? Same thing. Because you're family. So you might not like someone, but you learn to love them. And you do your service, and then maybe in time you become to like them. Because you put down walls and knock down your barriers and Make yourself a little vulnerable and open yourself up a little bit and become a friend. Sometimes people don't want to be friends because they don't want to get hurt. You know that? I mean, when sometimes a close person to you, you know, turns on you or doesn't remain friendly with you and you want them to be, that can be hurtful. There's no doubt about that. And how you handle that oftentimes determines how you grow as a Christian. You can either get bitter or better. But but the fact is you can't let that fear of the unknown stop you from doing what you're supposed to do right now. And that's love the brotherhood. When you're in church, you learn to love each other. Forbearing one another in what? In love. Ephesians, come on. Forbearing one another in love. You mean you've got to put up with each other. 
Come on. Some of us are easier to put up with than others. <laughs> but the fact that matters, you've got to put up with all, we all got to put up with each other. Well, that's what Peter said, love the brotherhood. Isn't that important? You only use your, not your liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Galatians 5.13 So the idea that we are to love each other and serve them, as he put in John 13, gives us a thought as to how we're supposed to go about our Christian life. When you become saved, and you become part of a body, a family, you get to know each other. And sometimes, you know, you, your familiarity breeds contempt. You, you see the quirks and the idiosyncrasies and the foibles that your brother or sister has and demonstrates at times. And you, you would kid around, laugh about it. It's okay. You know, put up with it. Deal with it. You're not so perfect either. Amen. You got some, some couple of screws loose too, amen? amen? Got a few things that aren't just perfect, you know? Amen. And you deal with it. But that's what makes the church beautiful. It's not like, you know, you know, not like, you know the Stepford Wives where everyone looks the same and acts the same and, you, you know, you're perfect and, you know. No, I mean, we're all kind of mishmash and thrown together and you learn to love each other. That's what makes it beautiful. Your family. Love one another. Serve. Do something. The more you do as you're doing things, part of the reason of being in the ministry is to keep a minister going is gives, gives him or her something to do. Gives those in the ministry something to do. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of what? Faith. Faith, right. Household. That's Timothy. Uh, Galatians, the household of faith. Uh, it says, uh, Galatians 6.10, As we therefore have opportunity to do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. Amen? So that's talking about the Christians. Honor all men was the first point. Yes, civility toward all. That doesn't mean you have to be Christians. You should be respectful to and civil toward everybody. But when it comes to the family of God, the brotherhood, it's a different level. There's a love extended. Come on. And they'll see that. They'll know that. Because they're, you know what connects us together is the love of Christ. That's what, that's what connects the church together. After it's all said and done, some of us have cer certain likes and dislikes with food and politics and um, social status and uh, economics. And everybody's got a different view of everything. That, that, boy, we, you would, we would drive each other crazy if we tried to agree on everything. Come on. Even in church like this, we would not agree on everything. Believe me. That's okay. But what, what do we agree on? God. Jesus. Salvation by faith and grace. Come on. And a home in heaven. And our blessed hope. We agree on those things. That's, that's what connects this church together. So with that, we, that trumps everything else. That is that preempts everything. That, that supersedes all. The most important thing is our faith in Christ. All the other things are secondary. They're ancillary. They're subsidiary. They're not as important. They're a function of. Not the result of faith. And that's why it's important to love the brother and you put up with people. You know, sometimes, and I'll give you an illustration before I move on to my third point. Sometimes in church, you'll have to, you'll learn, right? You'll learn to love somebody you ordinarily wouldn't have the opportunity to love if you weren't in church. Come on. Because you, let's say you only associate with people that have your same likes and interests. And you talk about the same things. I don't care what it is. I don't care. It doesn't use any venue you want. That's going to be your commonality. Once you leave that commonality, it's your family and friends or whatever. Church. Well, in church, you're going to, it's comprised of a lot of different people that have different interests and, you know, some things you may like, some things you don't. And those that like the same things even within church, they break into little pairs and they hang out together. That's okay. That's good. But in the meantime, you're learning to get along with other people that you might not have the opportunity to get along if it wasn't for church. 
and expand your horizon, you'll meet other people. You'll learn things. You never know who you're going to come across in church. You'll meet, honestly, you will meet some of the craziest people in church. But you know what? I'm going to tell you, you're going to meet the greatest people in church too. Amen. The greatest people will ever meet will be in church. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Try it again. The greatest people ever going to meet will be in church. Amen. Not just the crazies. Years ago, Brother Donovan was preaching here and, uh, on a Sunday morning, and I got here early, as I always do, and he was really early that morning, coming from Connecticut. And if you fellas, some of you remember Paul, Crazy Paul. Marion, you remember. Burn the Crazy Paul. Come on, Phil, sat in the back. You'd have to spray. You'd have to, d to spray. He, he didn't smell very good. Well, that, that, that's, he was that guy, Paul. He was crazy. No, we would not have a way to help the guys, no doubt about it. Anyway, Brother Donovan came over that day, and Paul was walking around the church, right? And he, he, he's walking, so Brother Donovan says, oh, Scott looks crazy. He's probably going to Brother Costa's church. And sure enough, he says, where are you going? He goes, I'm going to bless it all. He says, oh, sure enough, that's it. You know, and he came. <laughs> I mean, that guy wandered on the streets. And, but you know, that, that, and, that's, and that guy was crazy. I mean, we tried to help him, put him in a program and all that, and it just didn't work out. His sister called us back one day, and he says, Pastor, appreciate all your help. He says, we've tried that one for years. He goes, he's got more devils than Mary Magdalene. <laughs> and I said, no, we, we kind of know that from dealing with him. He's got problems. But as crazy as Paul was, he was crazy. Certifiable. You know, you, know what he, you know what he believed in? King James Bible. He did. He would know he knew the King James Bible is true. I mean, I don't know what that says for our crowd, but the fact of the matter is, he had the right book. It doesn't mean you have to be crazy like him, but it was, I just found that quite an anomaly, actually. But at any rate, love the brotherhood. Learn to love each other. In church. That's what Peter said. I, I like it. He said, honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Let's go back to 1 Peter 2.17. Great verse. Honor all men. A. B. Love the brotherhood. C. Fear God. Amen. If you want to give a ordinal uh, cardinal ordinance to any one of these four points, I would suggest fear God is north. <laughs> that would be north. I know that. You want to pick yours for east, west, and south. Go right ahead. But fear God is probably north because you got to go this way to get to God. <clears throat> Promotion comes not from the east, west, or south, but from who? God. Come on, Psalm 75. Promotion comes from God, north. That was Brother Lynn's line. I believe God lives in the north. North Carolina. I said, Jim, you're too much. But let's look at this. Fear God. So if honor all men is civility, love the brotherhood is serve or service, fear God is obedience. How, did, how do we fear God? Obey. It's pretty simple. I mean, that's the simplest way to sum it, sum I, summarize fear God. Because fearing God has lots of applications. I mean, it's, it is general. I'd like to condense it. And it, you, can't, you can't fear God properly in disobedience. Right? So, if you make it real simple, fear God, I'm going to equate it to obey. Obedience. Cornelius, Acts 10.2. He was a man who feared God. And he did good. And as a result of his doing good, you know what God did? God sent Peter right to his doorstep. And when God sent Peter to, and he said he feared God, Cornelius, and he sent Peter to his doorstep, and Peter went there with the express purpose of giving him the gospel. You with me? You guys know the story? He gives him the gospel. What does he do immediately when Peter preached to him? He gets saved in his whole household. He obeyed the gospel. He didn't, he didn't argue with Peter. He didn't justify himself. He was waiting on someone to point him in the right direction because he was doing right. He, he used that great example of Romans 2 about doing right and being led to life everlasting. It's a great verse, and that's, he's a great example of that. So Cornelius in Acts 10, verse 2, um, you can take a look at it real quick. Look at Acts 10, 2. You'll see what I'm saying. And then I'll give you another example. 
He feared God with his whole house. And as a result, he got saved because he, he obeyed the word of God. You know, every, are you saved here? Amen. If you're saved, you know what you did? You obeyed the word of God. Amen. I'll give you the verse in a minute. It's uh, <clears throat> Romans 6.17. But before we do that, let's look at Acts 10.2. This is Cornelius. Well, I'll, I'll go 10.1. Watch this, John. you like it. There was a certain man in uh, Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the what? I can't read that. What does it say? Italian band. Come on. Goomba. A devout man and one that feared God with his whole house. Look at that. Devout, feared God, and gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Four points right there. Feared God. He, he uh, devout man. He feared God. He gave alms and he prayed. Beautiful. So in verse 2, he says he, that he feared God. That's the point I want to get across. By the way, when Peter preaches to him, his, he gets saved and his whole family gets saved. Everybody gets saved. When you got saved, it's a result of this. I'll read it to you real quick. You don't have to go there. It's going to say this in Romans 6. Come on, baby. Romans 6, 17. I'll read it to you quick. Uh... Romans 6, 17. Here it is. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. Watch. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Obeyed from the heart. That's how you got saved. At some point in your life, you obeyed the gospel like Cornelius did. You prayed to be saved. God heard your prayer and you got put into the body of Christ. Amen. It all, it, you know what that is a function of? You fearing God. At some point in your life, you know, he said, you, you, you heard that, you, you want to go to heaven, you don't want to go to hell, you realize your sins are not leading you in a good way, you don't feel good about yourself, you, 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 fear is a good thing. He feared God and he got saved. Noah feared God, it says in Hebrews 11, 7, and he built an ark that was saving his house, and he, when he heard it, he moved with what? Fear. Building an ark to, ark to the saving of his house. Hebrews 11, 7. And Noah heard God. He moved with fear because of what was going to happen to the world. Cornelius heard the gospel and feared God and was praying devoutly, wanting further revelation. Listen, if you pray, you do right. God is duty bound. That's the verse I use, Romans 2 and Acts 10, that he's duty bound to give you more truth. Amen. God will deliver more truth. Come on, you with me? When you seek after truth, as you seek after other things, God is duty-bound to put people in your life to point you in the right direction and give you the truth that you desire. That's who He is. He's not, he's not going to lead you on a wild goose chase. If you're seeking after God, He's going to help facilitate your desires and give you the truth. After all, that's what He wants. It's God's will that all men be what? Saved. All men be saved. That's His will. So if his will is that all men be saved and you're seeking after truth, he's going he's gonna to rearrange people's lives. He, you go deal with that person. Help that person out. Amen. Talk to that person. This person happens you know. Those two people that crashed before the thing, I gave them a track. I said, you read this. You happened to do this right in front of a church. And we, we swept up their debris. They didn't know what they were doing. And if, this, this couple that just, yeah, they were going to church. So it hurt just to get that big broom and back. They dropped. It was all in the street in front of 112 here. It was a bunch of junk. They, they, I felt bad. I thought they hit by a car. They pulled over. Stop. We'll help him. So Phil and Homer and Justin, thank God we swept it up real quick and got the and gave her a track in the meantime. Said, thank God. And then some, somebody drove by. Must have been friends. Thank you for helping them. Yeah, no problem. You happen to do this right in front of our church. So someone else could have just left you alone. I, I've seen some weird stuff right there on the corner of 4th Street and 112. One day there was a, a battery, man. I mean, a, a battery in the middle of the road right here on 4th Street. A car battery. It was sitting there. You know, the most fell, fell. And, you know, you know, people come around the road that road quickly. It's right in the middle of the road. So as soon as I came into church, I, it was last year's time, I went back out and no one was there. I took the thing and I pushed it out of the way. Oh, I mean, the fell the truck. Yeah, definitely. The Hershon, right. Right. Probably come in, turned, and right. They're sitting there and, you know. Well, I've seen other debris, too. Uh, lots of junk. You know, every day when I walk around, I'm picking up 
uh, crumpled up uh, cigarette cartons and um, beer cans and um, you know all sorts of stuff. And one one day the all, all sorts of malt liquor, uh, colt. What is that other one? The no the sp spiked hard la hard lemonade or some spiked hard. And you know so then I, one wasn't empty. I dumped it. I put it in the garbage can here. So I'm like, okay, so fellas, someone goes through a garbage yard, Pastor Joe, you're drinking again. <laughs> <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> no, I'm cleaning up is what I'm doing. <laughs> but, the f <laughs> but the thing is that fearing God is a never-ending battle. It doesn't, it's not like you fear God once and you stop. You fear God to get saved and you fear God every day in your life. You should walk with fear. Walk circumspectly, right. But you know, here's the, here's the verse. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear the God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. I'm going to give you a verse in a second, because some of you might be thinking, commandments of the Old Testament. It is. But I'm going to give you a verse in the New Testament to help change, shape your opinion. But before I do that, just think of this for a minute. Fear God. That's obedience. Noah obeyed, Cornelius obeyed, and certainly Solomon, eventually in his life, he obeyed after he did what he had to do. He came to realize that late in his life. And no matter where you are in your journey as a Christian, at some point, at some point in your journey, listen, you come to the revelation, hopefully, before it's too late, that your primary responsibility is to love God. Amen. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy mind, thy soul, thy strength. Fear God. Keep his commandments. It's the whole duty of man. That supersedes everything else. If you love God properly, listen, you will love the brother, brotherhood properly. Husbands will love their wives properly. Wives will love their husbands properly. Parents will love their children properly. Children will love their parents properly. Everything falls in place if there is that proper love to establish. And it comes by fearing God. Walking with God. Amen? Simple verse, isn't it? Turn to 1 John 5 for a minute. 1 John 5, 3. One verse, it's got lots of meanings, though. I mean, lots of understanding in here. It's pregnant with meaning. Put it that way. 1 John 5, 3. He says, Fear God, Solomon, and keep his commandments. That's the whole duty of man. So 1 John 5, 3 helps put a different understanding on the commandments, not just the Old Testament commandments. Everybody got 1 John 5, 3? For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Look at that. His commandments are not grievous. They're not, they're not going to cause you grief. They're not going to... Exactly. They're not grievous to you. They're not, they, you, know what, you know what's grievous to you? is sin. Yeah, right. They're right. This is for your good. It's not that they're going to grieve you. But, but keeping his commandments will help you. Reading his word, obeying his word, loving the brotherhood, fearing God. These simple little commandments are, under, are very important for us to get. By the way, this is one of the trivia questions I asked the four horsemen. What's the shortest sentence in the Bible besides Amen and Selah? Shortest sentence in the Bible besides amen and say la. Fear God. Right there. It's a sentence within a verse. I didn't say the shortest verse. That's Jesus wept. Shortest sentence is right there. Fear God. Seven, seven letters. Sentence. That's a, that's a sentence, but it's also a verse. This isn't a verse. It's part of a verse. So the shortest verse is Jesus wept. Shortest sentence is fear God. Assuming you take amen and say la out of the equation. Amen. Selah. And the four horsemen got that because they, they, they actually didn't they, think they got it. Well, actually, they came up with Selah. And I said, I'm sorry. I said, don't say amen, but I forgot to mention Selah. So one of them said Selah. I said, well, I'm, I meant to say Selah too. So very good. But did you guys ever get that? If you're God? You Googled it. <laughs> I got it. Next time I give you a trivia, you can't Google it. You got to figure it out. This Google has destroyed it. <laughs> No, oh, that's good. They're, they're, they are, they're in church. They're being honest right now. For this is the commandment that 
Commandments are not grievous. Amen. Uh, fear God, very important. Noah feared God. Cornelius feared God. Feared God. Solomon came to an understanding of fear God. Every Christian should fear God. You know, you say, what is fear? Fear is fear. The Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Fearful? Why? It's fearful. You know, knowing the terror of the Lord would persuade men. You know, if you were to meet, that's right, a king. We'll get to the king in a minute, the next verse. Honor the king. But if you meet someone powerful, there's trepidation sometimes involved because of the power this person may wield. But at the same time, God, we don't, we can't, that, don't have that perspective. But when Job met God, he found out quickly who was the king. And Job was a righteous man and really didn't do anything wrong. Then he found out he wasn't as righteous as he thought. But the point being, he wasn't getting Amen. hammered for being unright. He, just, he was going to learn something from it. But still, even as good as he was and as righteous as Job was, he says, wow, I'm undone, man. I'm, I'm, you already said it about himself. I'm vile. Job says, I'm vile. Like, like we compared to God, even though he's one of the three most righteous men of the Old Testament, he says, I'm vile. Because he meets God in that moment. It's like, that's all of us in our best state. Amen. Man, his best, best state. Is altogether what? Vanity. Vanity. Best state. Not worst state. And then you, you, you reach that point, you just cry out, oh Lord, I, I'm undone, I'm vile. Because you, you're, you're before God. It's a fearful thing to fall at the hands of the living God. That's all there is to it. We come before the Lord, we talk about it, and uh, you know, Brother Ray is there. He's in God's presence. He's in the Lord's presence. Sister Joyce is in the presence of the Lord now. It's another one I passed on that you, some of us know Arnie and Joyce. I, didn't, I never got the information from Arnie. I, I feel bad I, to, to, to want to respond. and So that didn't happen. I don't really have, I have his number again, but I did have the conversation with him. So I just felt bad. I didn't get the info. And I would have certainly did something on behalf. But he knows we love him. And, uh, but she's with the presence of the Lord right now. Joyce. Uh, others that have passed on that are saved. We, we, they're, they're in the presence of the Lord. Yes, it's great because they're in a new body and a new mind and all that. But when you first meet coming to the presence of the Lord, there's got to be a, an awe, a uh, feel like, wow, this is actually happening. It's, it's like, probably it, it's beyond what our, what our understanding can get now. You can't grasp it. So fear God, shortest sentence, powerful sentence, and it's a north on your compass. Amen? All right, lastly. So we got so far as uh, civility, honor all men, love the brotherhood is serve, fear God is obedience, and lastly, it says, honor the king. Look at it right there, First Peter 2, 17. Honor the king. That's respect. Respect the law. Hello? Respect authority. Uh, teachers, respect your teachers. <laughs> respect civil authorities. Have respect. All right, look at First Timothy chapter two. I was saying, respect the teacher. I was looking at John, making him laugh. He recently had to leave a, a school because he, <laughs> he wasn't showing much respect there. First Timothy chapter two verses one through four. Let's read. Res years ago, they said respect your elders. You don't hear that anymore. That's that's like old school. That's archaic. That's as old school as me eating a buttered bagel, buttered roll this morning. That's old school. Respect y'all. But I, I mean, when we were kids, you know, right? We didn't we feel? Didn't you have a fear of it? I, you know. As an adult, I mean, right? Come on. I mean, we used to play stickball across the street from where, where I lived, and I lived across the street from Holy Family uh, Catholic School. That uh, it was a school and church and school. We ended. Up, we got married there, and, th and it had uh, the newer side and the the, the church side, and, the, and then the, the school side. Well, I lived right across the street from the school, and we would during the summer jump over the fence, play softball there, stickball, touch football. Growing up, always. Well, 
the stick ball was really a perfect spot for it. It was just a really brick wall. And, but, and the fence wasn't that far. He could hit a home run. But the problem is uh, Mr. Alberti's house was here on the other side of the fence. And it's a tennis ball you're playing with. You're not going to. But there's times hit the ball hard and he broke the window. And Mr. Alberti was a big guy. And we only could play there and not fear if his son Nicky played with us. Because then if Nicky was with his, you know, his, his son, we can't get us in trouble. But if he's not playing and we hit his house and they come out and they yell at us, we'd scatter like cockroaches. I told you kids, stop playing. And we run. The kids are going to play. What do you do? We hopefully, we hit it. If you, it's a home run if you hit it over the fence, but you hope you hit the house, hit the chimney or something. You don't hit the window? Come on. Can I get an amen? There's some t- I never broke the window, thank God. I've, I hit the house numerous times, but never broke the window. But a few times that happened, we scattered, because then he'd come out looking for us and yelling at us, and we wouldn't play for him. Why? We were afraid. We got caught in the schoolyard, I remember, uh, in, in playing there, because they would have, they'd chain it up, you know, it was a Catholic school, and we'd jump over the fence and play. Well, then, you know, I mean, one day, one of the brothers, you know, one of the brothers came out to chase us, you know, because the guy that worked there was a little special, so... You know, it was a little, we were kind of terrible then, you know. And he ran after us, and we kind of made fun, and we just ran away. He couldn't catch us. Well, this guy was, you know, his brother. He wasn't, you know. And he came out out of nowhere. We didn't expect that. He tore, that, tore after us. We're like, oh, no. We got so scared. He grabbed us, me and Russell, and threw us up against the wall. You kids aren't supposed to be here. I mean, you're a kid. You're playing. You get scared. This big adult yells at you. Today, what are you yelling at? Yeah, yeah, they'd, they'd fight back at you. Come back with a gun or something. You don't know. You don't know what they would do. There was a sphere. There was a there was respect to an elder. There really was. It's, it's, there's a generation that is clean in his own eyes and not washed no filthiness. Proverbs 30. They think they're, they're deceived. They think they're clean. They're not. So 1 Timothy 2, I went off on a, uh, a side note there. Let's read this. Verses 1 through 4, watch this. <clears throat> Talking about honor of the king. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For who? Kings. And for all that are in authority. That we, m- why? Why pray for the leaders? So we should have, we have Christian, a Christian country? That's not what it says. It says, pray for them that we might lead a quiet and peaceful life in all goodly, godliness. And that's what you pray for. That, they, that we could leave a, lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Amen. Amen. So that's, that's praying for kings and those in authority. The Bible says in Romans 13.1 that um, Romans 13.1 says to uh, Obey the authorities that be. Um, you, you are to give uh, obedience to the, the authorities that, that you're under. We, we're under civil authority. If you don't have civil authority, you have anarchy. Right? And I'm not saying every government, every government civil authority is proper. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying that in general terms, civil authority is there to keep peace civilly. And you're supposed to honor the king. You honor the king by showing respect to those in authority. Police officers and uh, people who are, um, yeah, I mean, right, respectful. You, you know, recently you see this, they were throwing water at the police. And it was like, what was that about? Almost 13 one. Oh. No, it's not. No, exactly. I'm saying you saw that like recently. I was like, what was that about? I mean, as a kid, I wouldn't, I mean, le- I can't think about throwing someone, walking up to a cop and dousing them in water. No, there's no way. Back in the day in Brooklyn, forget about it. There's no way. I saw the days, one day in my office in the city on 42nd Street when I first started working in Manhattan. I think I told you guys a story at one point. I did. I don't know who heard it, but there was a couple of cops. Back, back in the day, the cops were big too. They had to meet a certain quota. Height and big. And it was, one, it was an Italian guy and an Irish guy. They, they came into, that, into, our, into my uh, office there and in the hallway. Some guy was running around trying to rob pocketbooks from women. Running in and grabbing it, right? 
He was probably drugged up. Well, they, I went out to the bathroom that afternoon, and I didn't know what was happening. All of a sudden, I see these two cops. They grabbed this guy, Phil. They, they grabbed him. Young, he was young, young, kind of fairly young. Grabbed him, and they, they, they caught him. But what, dude, what are you doing with that? What was that? And then he looked, you know, terrorized. He dropped it. Picked, they picked the guy up. They picked the guy up like this. Like this. They put him against the wall. It's like Big Bill. I can see Big Bill doing that. Picked the guy up. Like this, and his feet were dangling. I'm coming out to the bathroom. I go, this is a great sight. But like my first week in the city. They hold the guy up against the wall. His feet are dangling. And they're reading him the riot act, you know. They drop him. And he takes off. Gets out. Today, he wouldn't do that. He was scared, though. Today, he would have to be careful. That was a different view of watching him get doused with water. I didn't get that thing. But the idea that obey the powers and, you know, if every Christ, if everybody lived like you, listen to me, church, it would be a better place. You, I don't, you don't think anybody here is leaving here thinking about we're going to break into a car? No. I mean, hello? <laughs> Tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> and, well, Justin, you were here one night when someone tried to break into your car. Wasn't that you? Billy's truck, right? It, exactly. That was on a Wednesday night here. And did he get anything? It was here. Yeah, the, Justin had the, one of the trucks, and the guy was here in the backyard, and he's, his window was down, and he was in there like trying to rummage through something. I mean, the last thing in the world anyone here is thinking is going to be robbing somebody, stealing something, breaking into somebody's house. Because somebody say Amen. amen. I mean, to have some respect, I mean, when you don't have God in your life, it's like the Wild West. You don't know what, you, they're capable of doing anything. And, it's, and, then, and then, then we've got to just trust the Lord, protect us, and God give us wisdom. But if everyone lived the way we were living, we wouldn't have to worry about a lot of stuff. You'd have respect. Honor the king. You know, people have said, what do you honor when the king is mean and bad. Now, 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 that's tough. I mean, I'm not going to... Go back to First Peter. We'll close. I'll give you a verse. That, you know, I can't... I'm not... That's, you, you need grace from God. That's all I can tell you. Okay? But there's going to be... When Peter wrote this, when Peter wrote First Peter, you know who the king... You know who the Caesar was? No. He was Nero. 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 You know what Nero was famous for? burning Christians, putting their heads on stakes and lighting their way into Jerusalem, and then, then blaming the burning of the city on Christians so he could build a palace. Wicked stuff. It's just wicked. And Peter has the audacity to say, honor the king. I mean, he's not saying, we're not saying... You ought you endorse his life, his lifestyle, or the way he's living, or the, the rules he's passing. But you still try to honor it to the best of your ability to stay out of trouble. Listen, trouble could come to anyone, right? Cambodia, Pol Pot, right? Trouble could come any at any at any regime. Mao Zedong. You never know when it's going to rise up. We don't know. We've been fortunate to live in America when we have, and we we we've been sovereign nation, really free of foreign interference in terms of the way our country operates um, to the best of our understanding. And we, we have liberties to come and go and freedom. And you got to respect those laws. I mean, there's some places you don't have the freedoms we have here. And then when you have it, you don't want to lose it. That's why, that's why I referenced that on Sunday with Hong Kong. Once you have something, it's not easy to give it up. If we were asked to live a different type of life now in America, we would, we would not like that because we're not used to that. Um, you know, when I was in the Philippines on a few occasions, and the Philippines is, a, you know, democracy. It's, a, it's not a communist. It's, you know, there's a freedoms there and liberties. But even there, you, what, what we represent to them is the epitome of the government that works right. When we live here, we see it differently. <laughs> but they see it like, wow, you're an American. And you are, you are viewed upon, if you want to go to the Philippines, anybody go, you'll see what I'm saying. They will view you differently than an average Filipino. You're an American, so automatically they think you have money. That's true. Number one, you have money. And you're an American. 
It's like you're coming from the promised land. Really, that's how they view it. When American preaches, they'll listen to you. That's why Bruce loves it over there because he hates it. He complains about it, but he's doing great because Bruce is a big guy and imposing and he, he'll talk up a storm, Bruce, and he's just preaching to anybody and they'll, they'll stop and they'll listen. He'll preach to anybody and they listen because they get respect for being an American. Plus, he's a big fellow and he's preaching the gospel. He's preaching the word of God. So all that's in his favor. And I know when I was there, it was, that's the way it was. It's like there's, there's automatic respect for you. Because we rescued them in World War II, and they never forgot that. So, again, respect is important, honor the king. And I think for us, it's just a matter of be respectful, all right? Uh, we'll close with that. So our four points tonight uh, had to do with civility, service, obedience, and respect. Let's pray and ask God to help us. Father, be with us tonight. I pray you'd be with those who aren't feeling well tonight. I pray, Lord, for Kitty. You'd have mercy upon her. Help her, Lord. Please help her, Father. Help others, Lord, who are sick and going through different things right now. Help us, Lord, to stay close to you. Keep our eyes on you. Obey you. Walk with you. And cleanse our hearts and our minds on a regular basis. Unite us safely, Lord, in your presence for uh, Sunday service. And for those who come into the game tomorrow night, meet here and pray you give us a good game and you don't get uh, stormed out of the game. So pray that it all goes well. Thank you again for your mercy and kindness and all you've done for us. Help us keep our eyes on you. Cover our building with your precious blood and bless the members here. And help us, Lord, to uh, look forward with great anticipation to what you have for us Sunday. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.